Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I did deliberately make this title of my presentation provocative because sometimes first you have to get people's attention. And um, I'll be talking today about our own family's experience and what we learned from it. And actually, a lot of things that I'll be talking about, John has already discussed. And I'll be putting it into the terms of our own personal experience. So this is Fervid Trimble. She was actually my mother-in-law. And uh, her dad chose her name out of the dictionary. That's the family story. She was raised in Alberta, um, very, very poor. She managed to put herself through school, even to the point where she was able to get a master's degree in business education. She was a pretty remarkable woman. Here she is at the age of 86. She's living in a senior's complex in the independent living part of it, um, where she had some help, uh, fixed her own breakfast and lunch, would go downstairs to the dining room for dinner, and was really a very healthy person. Um, she did use a walker if she was walking any distance. But she was definitely not what I would call frail in terms of what John has been talking about today. However, something happened. One of those crises of function that John was mentioning. She, this was the winter, she'd had a bad flu. She woke up one morning feeling very weak and dizzy. Um, she didn't think she could get out of bed without passing out. So she phoned my uh, sister-in-law who lived close by and asked to be taken to the emergency room. A and there she uh, was found to have, um, basically, she was dehydrated and she also was having problems with, I think, sodium levels in her blood. So they rehydrated her, sent her back to her apartment, and next day she was seen by the doctor who um, worked for the whole complex. And at that point, um, she was still feeling quite weak, and the doctor said, I think you should go to the care center, which was a, a building that was attached, where it was like a skilled nursing floor, it looked pretty much like a hospital to me, for a few days to recuperate. But what happened is instead of Fervid recuperating in a few days, she got a lot worse. And when I say worse, I mean particularly cognitively. So here she is with all these cognitive problems all of a sudden, um, delirious at times, hallucinating, um, sometimes not recognizing family members, this is my husband's brother, Bruce, worrying, because Fervid is not herself. She became increasingly confused, and as I said, delirious, and of course, during all this was bedridden. So one of the things I had learned with other elderly relatives is that if someone is having new symptoms that you haven't seen before, maybe you should find out if they've been put on any new medications that might actually be causing these symptoms and talk to the doctor about that. Because what I've found is that side effects don't seem to be recognized very regularly by doctors, often because they're not looked for, especially in an older person they say, oh, well, you know, you're just getting older, more things will happen, and so on. So side effects are not looked at. The number of drugs is not looked at or reviewed sometimes at all. So what we found out as a family, because I have a library background and I had dealt with some of these medication problems with other relatives before, is I started looking, first of all, found out what new drugs she'd been put on and she had. She'd been put on an SSRI for depression, and she'd been put on a drug called tramadol, which is a pain drug. And these both um, have an effect on serotonin in your syndrome, in your system, and cause serotonin syndrome. These are the side effects of those drugs, and they are the things that 
fervid was, was displaying. She was confused, agitated. Sometimes she'd be sleeping in, in the middle of the day in such a way that we actually couldn't wake her up. Um, she was doing strange arm movements that we'd never seen her do before. So she was acting in ways that, w that were new. We'd never seen this. The only difference was that she was now on other drugs, more drugs. And what ha often happens is the drugs are sometimes prov are provided by two different doctors. So she received one from a geriatric psychiatrist. The other one was received from the doctor on the floor. And I really wonder who is in charge of looking for interactions or seeing if those drugs actually work well together. Nobody seems to be responsible for monitoring the drugs. Also what happens, um, she was now in a part of the uh, complex, seniors complex, where they didn't know her. So if she was confused and hallucinating, they might just think, well, maybe that's how she is. Maybe she's, maybe she's demented. We knew that she wasn't, but they're just seeing a snapshot in time. And that's why it's so important for family members to be involved in the care of elders, because they know that person over time. They know what is normal for them, what isn't normal. And you can be such a help to the medical team. It's not that they don't attend well. It's just that they're not seeing the big picture, which the family often knows. So what in the end happened was we managed to finally, after many weeks, get a meeting with the medical staff brought our information that I had carefully researched and said, here's what we think is happening. We think she's having an interaction between these two new drugs. She never showed these symptoms before. We don't think she has vascular dementia, which is what the, the geriatric psychiatrist was saying and wanting to give her yet more drugs. We said, I think, we think this is an interaction. We'd like you to do whatever you need to do to taper off these drugs. We didn't want to just go in and say, take her off everything, because you can't do that. Some drugs have to be tapered. So what happened, basically, was Fervid recovered completely cognitively. She was right back to normal from somebody who had been delirious, hallucinating, not recognizing family members, seeing people who weren't, weren't there. She was back to normal. The problem was that she had been bedridden so long by the time we got this straightened out that she had lost a lot of function and mobility. So she never was able to return to her independent living apartment. She lived for another four years. She was healthy. We would get the fold-up wheelchair and take her out to have white wine and oysters down at the, the restaurant that she loved nearby. But she could not return to independent living. If we had been able to do something about what we thought was happening much sooner, then I think that she could have had quite a, a different four years. So why is the family seeing these problems and the medical staff isn't noticing? First of all, if the patient is confused and delirious, they can't speak for themselves. But the family knows them, and quite often the family is spending hours by the bedside of that person. They're noticing things that the staff haven't even got time to notice because they're in and out and they're very task-oriented. Also, the family has what's called skin in the game. In other words, we have a reason not to give up, to try and find what the real answer is. And we won't give up if the answers we're getting don't make any sense. The staff also, uh, there's an impediment for them. They're seeing what they're, they see what they're used to seeing in that population. If they see confusion, they think it's a urinary tract infection, because that's what it often is with older, older people. But in this, in this case, it was not, even though she got antibiotics for a urinary tract infection. 
The contrast is, is the family is looking for things that are unusual. It's like, why is this new thing happening? What does this signify? What has happened that my loved one is behaving in a way that I don't recognize? So as John you know, said earlier, comfort and function are often what people want. They're not interested in every technological intervention to try and have a longer life. They just want to feel good, be with their family, be at home, and be comfortable. So one of the things that I did when um, there was uh, going to be a, a diagnosis of vascular dementia and another drug added is I looked up that drug that was being suggested and found that it really isn't very useful anyway and probably would have given Fervid more of the same bad drug side effects that she was already having. So here's my recommendation for family members. Stay very involved. Try and get a list of the medications that have been prescribed. You may not be able to do that because of privacy issues, but if you look at a represent, getting a representation agreement, that allows you to make health decisions for your loved one in the province of British Columbia. And I've uh, put the website there of a nonprofit organization that helps with all of these different aspects of care, end of life care, representation agreements, powers of attorney, and all the things that you need to know about. I would advise you to talk to a pharmacist if you're worried about the drug list and try and let them know what kinds of symptoms you're noticing. Are they confused? They have dry nose all the time. Do they complain of being weak or dizzy when they stand up? If you can talk to a pharmacist, that might be quite helpful as a leading step. Find out what the drugs are for. Whether the, those drugs can be monitored, stopped, the dosage reduced, or other safer drugs that can be substituted. And if you can arrange it, ask for a medication review with your loved one's doctor. Not so easy to do. They're not trained to do these kinds of reviews, except for people like John, who've been doing them forever. But um, often, nobody looks at the entire list Sometimes that doesn't get done until you're actually in a care home. That might be the first time anyone ever looks at your entire list of medications to see if there are problems or interactions. Um, I took a picture of this a few months ago. I don't know if you know, but if you're on five or more drugs in the province of British Columbia, you can get a review by a pharmacist. Just go to your local pharmacy. There's also a pharmacist clinic at UBC, and they will, they will allow you to self-refer. Many people are referred by their doctors. If you're worried about a medication list, you can see about getting a referral. You don't necessarily have to go there. They work by distance, uh, means telephone, and so on as well. So I think um, one of my main points here is that Herbert lived another four years after this incident with some medications. And we had a really amazing relationship with her the last few years, the last few um, weeks of her life. She was cognitively there all the time. She got a chance to say what she needed to say to family members. Uh, we got a chance to become very close and have the kinds of conversations that are meaningful and become the legacy of that person. If she had died four years before that drug interaction, which could have been fatal, she would have died confused, delirious, and not recognizable. So for us, it was tremendously important um, for these um, matters to be cleared up. So actually, um, I'm coming to the same conclusion Finally, after all these years, I figured it out by listening to John Sloan over and over and over again. 
is that we should have kept her at home. At the point where she was being advised to go to the care center for a few days to recuperate, what we should have done is said, that's okay. One of us will stay with her for a few days. And we'll make sure that she's fine, that she gets her meals, you know, that we bring food up in the dining room, whatever is needed. We should have kept her at home. The last four years of her life would have been a lot different. And when we were actually refused an education review by the doctor at one point, we should have gone to management. We should have insisted on it. And if it really got bad, we should have gone to the media. But first of all, we should have kept her at home. By the way, all families get better care for their elders. Some studies show. Um, so I just wanted to show you the pictures of what someone on too many medication, medications can look like. This was fervent between her over medicated and a few weeks later, after those medications had been reduced and removed. This is Daisy. Her daughter, Elizabeth, has allowed me to use these pictures. Daisy came out from a care home in Ontario where she was very, very heavily drugged and with uh, quite a few antipsychotics as well. When she got here, she got into an excellent care home. They did a medication review, got her off a lot of medications right at the beginning, and this is her a couple of months later. This is the worst situation I've seen. This is Frances. Her daughter Christine asked me to use these pictures and to tell her story. And that is that uh, Frances was very heavily medicated with antipsychotics to the point where she had a, a, a drug reaction called tardive dyskinesia, which is an uncontrollable facial movement, eye movements, tongue and lip movements, and these are not controllable. Sometimes even after the drug is and stop these continue. It was so bad that Francis actually was mocked and teased by other people who were in the care home about these strange facial expressions that she was making. That's Francis after Christine took her out of the care home, took her home, saw a clinical pharmacologist, and she was gradually taking her off a lot of drugs, psychological drugs, and became pretty much back to the normal. Okay, so that's it for me. That's our family experience. And um, thank you very much for listening.